Suspension on mountain bikes can be a little bit confusing at times. I mean, do you know your offset from your anti-squat or your garter spring from your idler wheel? Yeah. Right, so today we're gonna to deal with this. We're gonna be looking at some air shocks. We're gonna look at some coil shocks. We're gonna look at some suspension forks, some suspension designs, some suspension terminology, and everything that can be a little bit confusing. And hopefully by the end of this video, you're gonna know everything you need to about suspension. Right, let's start with the suspension fork, something that should be pretty familiar to many of you. Okay, so suspension forks, let's start with the outside first. Now at the top of the fork, you have the steerer tube. This is what connects to the rest of your bike. Your stem will clamp on the top and your headset bearings and the frame will be housing this part of the fork. Next up, you have the fork crown. This is the bit that joins the two legs and pressed into the fork crown, you have these upper legs. The correct name for these is actually stanchion tubes, okay? So these are the stanchions, also known as the upper legs. These slide into the lower legs, which is actually known as the slider, okay? And then this has a fork brace. Quite often on the back of the fork, brace you'll see a couple of threaded sort of inserts that's for joining a mud guard onto if you fancy doing that now at the bottom of these legs you have the axle system okay so it's typically a 15 millimeter axle sometimes known as a qr15 like this one but sometimes they have an allen threaded axle basically that just goes straight in very simple uh, nice and light and stiff now the distance between the axle spacing tends to be 110 millimeters this is known as boost but older forks tend to be 100 millimeters, which you could well have on your bike. Now the bottom of the left hand leg, you have the brake mounts, okay? They all pretty much are the same and depending on your fork travel, you'll have different options built into this and you'll have a capacity. And what I mean by capacity is the maximum rotor size. Now you probably wouldn't want to put a 220 mil rotor on a skinny little cross country fork like this because it's just gonna show all of the flex in the fork and you just don't need that much power. On bigger downer forks, of course, you're gonna run a rotor up to that size. At the top of the lower legs here, you'll notice there are the seals, okay? And then the little silver bit, this is known as a garter spring, okay? So it essentially helps keep the seal in place. Now, if you were to look on the inside of these lower legs, you'll find they have bushings on them. Now, don't forget it's a telescopic design. So the bushings are essentially there to help the upper legs or those stanchions slide into the sliders nice and smoothly in order to have that telescopic action. Now on modern suspension forks, most forks off the market and probably the forks on your bike will have an air spring in them. And you'll have one leg will be uh, dedicated to the spring and the other leg will be dedicated for damping. In this case, it's a fox fork, which means the rider's left leg. And I say rider's left, that means when you're looking down at your fork, you'll have your spring. In this case, it's an air spring. If I just undo the top cap here, you can see it has a Schrader valve, much like the one you would have on a car to inflate the tires. On the inside of that, you can adjust the air volume and the air pressure. We'll get to the volume shortly. Now on the other leg, it's a damping leg and you'll have two major adjustments, compression and rebound. Compression always tends to be blue. You might find a few variations, but typically the standard is blue for compression and red for rebound, which is found at the bottom. Now the compression adjustment on forks does vary. This one actually has a remote control offering so you can lock it out from the handlebars, but more often than not, they'll either have a dial or they'll have some kind of lever. Uh, the lever may be multiple position, anything up to three positions, which would be open, mid and closed. And when I say closed, that's effectively locked out. So that's great for climbing up those hills. Now, although most forks you can buy off the shelf these days have air springs in them, there are also coil options available and you can also have coils retrofitted to many forks on the market. And one last thing to reference on the outside of forks, this is a slightly bigger fork, this is a Fox 36, and it has these little bleed valves here. Now occasionally you can get sort of a pressure buildup inside the lower legs on forks. Now typically this tends to be if you're riding extreme terrain. When I say extreme, I'm referencing proper alpine terrain with like 45 minute descents downhill bike territory essentially. And as a result of that sort of pressure buildup, the forks can actually resist compressing a little bit. So you need to sort of atmospherically balance the forks. There's a number of ways of doing this, but Fox in particular have incorporated these little valves. You can just depress them to release that pressure buildup. Now don't worry if your forks don't have this, more than likely they don't need it. Some forks actually have a hole built into them for this to atmospherically balance automatically. But also, this is for extreme terrain. Most of us won't ever even need this feature. Okay, and the last thing you might wanna know about suspension forks is about fork offset. Yeah, what exactly is that? Now, the name is fairly simple. It refers to how offset the upper legs are in relation to that steerer tube, okay? 
this is a measurement that's taken here at the crown, but actually what it really means is where the axle is in correspondence to your steering axis, okay? Now this directly affects a measurement called trail. Now trail is a measurement that's calculated between the tire contact patch and the imaginary steering axis all the way down to the ground, okay? So that is your trail measurement. A small amount here or a small number of trail is gonna mean faster steering. A large amount of trail means slower steering. Now in both cases, it could mean different things. Faster steering could mean agile and responsive or it could mean nervous. Yeah, and the opposite can be said of the slow steering. It could be slow and lethargic or it could be stable. Okay, so it's not always what you might think just from those numbers. Now to get those numbers, you have to change the position of the fork axle here, like the front wheel axle, in front of that steering axis. To get that, you have to have an offset crown, okay? So a cross-country bike, for example, or a cross-country fork like this one, tends to have more offset to give it a faster responsive feel. This one has 51 millimeters, and you can see how far stepped forwards the upper legs are in relation to the steering tube, whereas an enduro bike or an enduro fork is gonna want more stable handling, slower handling, so when you really bring up to speed through stuff, you have more control. And that's why this one has nearly no offset. Look at that. So that crown is nearly in line with the steering tube and this is a complete opposite, okay? So that is what you need to know about fork offset. Oh, actually, one more thing on fork offset. You can't just put a fork with short offset on your bike and think that it's gonna change the handling dramatically. It doesn't always work like that because the number has to work with all of the rest of the geometry. Bearing in mind that putting a fork with a shorter offset on is gonna make your bike feel shorter as well. Okay, so the bike needs to be longer in the first place to handle a fork with less offset. And there's a few variations of fork to discuss as well. Uh, first up is a downhill fork, also known as a triple clamp or a twin crown. A uh, twin crown is actually more fitting because of the fact it has an additional crown and the upper legs, the stanchions, they go all the way up to the top. This allows for, if it has an air spring, for basically much more room inside, more room for damping components and oil and stuff, and of course a much stiffer fork. Now this tends to be on forks of 200 millimeters in travel upwards. It's just not necessary on forks of 150 millimeters or anything like that. That said though, RockShox had brought out a fork called the Zeb, which has up to 190 millimeters of travel with just a single crown. It's a bit of a beast though. Inverted forks are the next variation, uh, often called upside down forks, although technically they're the correct way up. Now the way to think about this is we have our sliders at the bottom, okay? And we have our stanchions at the top. On a motorbike, they're the other way up, okay? Hear me out here. So you have the stanchions at the bottom and they have an axle connected to the wheel and you have the much bigger and stronger sliders at the top connected to the crowns. Okay, so it's kind of logical. You have the bigger bit of the fork at the top. That's responsible for your steering response for your fore and aft control under braking. Bearing in mind that motorbikes can be a lot heavier than mountain bikes, okay? The good thing about this as well is you have oil that naturally sits on top of the seals of the fork, keeping them lubricated, whereas on our correct way out forks or inverted, whichever way you want to refer to it. Uh, we rely on the capillary action of the oil basically sitting between the bushes and the stanchion tube in order to lubricate them. Okay, so arguably an inverted fork should be better. The problem is with mountain bikes is we have to keep things light enough to actually use. On a motorbike, you can overbuild these things to keep them stiff enough. By having the stanchions at the bottom on a mountain bike, it's very difficult to get them stiff enough uh, whilst retaining the weight limits we need to use on a mountain bike. There are some great designs out there, like this Intend fork though. Beautiful fork, very stiff, and it works really well. Not exactly cheap though. The next variation is the lefty. Oh, I love these things. So yeah, this is a left hand leg fork, single leg fork. There's nothing here. Uh, yeah, basically it works using a uh, witchcraft and magic. Uh, no, not really. So the original ones of these forks had a four sided stanchion tube with bearings that would run on each of them. This more modern fork, which lacks the upper crown, uh, losing a load of weight in the process, has a three sided profile, like triangular uh, on the inside here. They're immensely stiff, if anything, stiffer than their twin leg siblings, which is very hard to get your head around. It's an incredibly complex fork to manufacture. It's got the stub axle on the bottom, and because it's got a single leg, you have to have your spring in here. In, in this case, it's an air spring with a positive and negative, and it also has to have the damping, compression and rebound. It's incredibly difficult to manufacture and make these, but it really is a work of art. They're not for everyone though. 
And the very last variation to discuss are linkage forks. Uh, this one is an old AMP linkage fork from the 90s. Now, linkage forks have always been experimented with, but no one has quite mastered them yet. So telescopic forks, they work really well, yet they do have issues. They can bind, um, they can have flex in them. There's a number of things that they can have. And of course, the geometry changes under compression with a telescopic fork. The whole idea with linkage forks is you have a feature on them that can correct this. In particular, if I show you this fork, uh, these are actually no longer available. The company has ceased trading for the time being. But it's a bit of a work of, work of art, if you ask me. This has a trailing link design, so the link is behind the fork leg as opposed to in front of it. And as a result of this, it's got a few very unique characteristics. So unlike a suspension fork that's telescopic where the axle just uh, goes up and down, essentially, this actually moves backwards slightly. The cool thing with this is when you're hitting impacts coming from the front, they simply disappear because the wheel can move up and around that obstacle. It's phenomenal how it works. Very, very different feeling though compared to a normal suspension fork. And some of the other cool things are you can have anti-dive properties on a fork like this, which means when you load up the front end of the bike, you're not diving through the suspension, which means the suspension can remain to be very active when you're heavy on the brakes. That's a great feature for a fork to have. Uh, like I said, they're very, very unique. You don't see many of them around. The people that use these absolutely swear by them, and the people that don't either can't afford them or perhaps might be a bit opposed to the design. But something else interesting with this particular fork, which is made by Trust, is that under compression, the trail number increases. So remember I said a second ago, when a telescopic fork compresses, yeah, the trail actually, basically you get more nervous handling because your head tube angle steepens, yeah? Um, and your trail decreases, giving you like more responsive, or in this case, nervous handling. On a fork like this, that number actually increases. So the further the fork compresses, the more stable the bike gets. It's quite incredible. But unfortunately, these ones are no longer available. Okay, next thing to discuss are rear shock absorbers on the bikes, also known as the rear shock. Now, there's a few different variations, but I'm gonna show you first the classic air shock. This is very common, and a lot of you will have these on your bikes. Now, at either end, of the shock, you have what are known as the eyelets of the shock. And sitting inside these eyelets, you have bushes or bushings uh, and a series of shock hardware. That can be nuts and bolts. Uh, in this case, it's got a bearing on the end here just to aid a very slick and smooth action, okay? Then you have the actual main part of the shock, which is in two pieces. You have the main body and you have the shaft that slides into that main body. Now this part of the main body is known as the air sleeve, sometimes referred to as the air can. Uh, you see a lot of people talking about it like that. Now if I was to flip it up like this, you'll notice it kind of resembles a stanchion on a fork, and there's a seal just under there, be right in thinking that, uh, and then this part resembles the slider. Same basic concept, the way it slides in and out of there. Then at the top you have the air valve here, just like you would at the top of the suspension fork, and you have adjustments for compression and rebound. Just like on a suspension fork, rebound is always red and compression is always blue. Now the compression adjustment on shocks does vary and the, the position on the actual shock can vary as well. Sometimes you have ones like this one that actually has a cable running to a remote control at the handlebars. This is great for uh, cross country bikes and things like that. We wanna lock out the shock, make the bike sprint like a hardtail and then you can flick the lever again for the downhill sections and have it fully open and active. But for most bikes, you'll find this sit on the actual shock itself and it'll have a multi-position lever. This one has a three position lever. Yours might just have a single position uh, and it might not have any at all. It might have a fixed amount on there. Okay, so blue is always compression, red is always rebound. Now there's also a few other variations of shock on the market. Now, the one I'm just holding up is this one, but look at this design here. Look at that piece on there. Yeah, this is known as a piggyback shock. Now you tend to see these on bikes with more suspension travel. Um, and the reason for this is essentially it can hold more oil and has more consistent damping. The downside is it's a bit heavier because you've got this extra component. But on the inside of here, you have a piston. And on the other side of that piston, you have either air or nitrogen, depending on the model of shock absorber that you have. Now this essentially allows for the, uh, the expansion of the oil into that chamber under compression. Okay, so it allows for a more consistent feeling handling with damping response and also it caters for the fact that oil gets hot 
Okay, so when oil gets hot, it can get slightly thinner and you get a phenomenon known as damping fade. Okay, by having the oil that can move out of the main shock body and into this piggyback remote reservoir, it can actually stay at a cooler temperature and offer more consistent responsive feeling basically. Uh, this is why you always have a piggyback reservoir on downhill style shocks. Now downhill style shocks themselves can either be an air shock, something like this, or they can be a coil shock like this one. Okay, so the only difference with a coil shock absorber really is the fact instead of having an air spring on the inside, it has a coil spring on the outside. Now here's one without the spring on it, but it's the same thing. And the shock absorber itself does the same exact job. You have this shaft which pushes into here and you have a series of shims on the inside that the oil flows through and which are controlled with two dials, one for compression and one for rebound. It's the same basic principle on all shocks. See this one has a blue dial here for compression and a red dial here for rebound. Now coil shocks are well known for their very responsive feeling. They're very, very sensitive, especially good on smaller bumps and for giving grip in cornering. Okay, but the downsides to them is they can be heavier. This one has a titanium spring, which compensates for that, but uh, it won't exactly compensate you in the wallet department. They're very pricey, okay? Now, this sort of style shock with a coil spring tends to be quite a bit heavier than an air shock. They don't always work on modern suspension bikes, both for clearance, because the actual coil spring is quite big. It won't physically fit on all bike designs, and it won't work very friendly with all bike suspension designs. Air by nature is very progressive. Coil springs by nature are a bit more linear in their action, okay, so your bike has to cater for that. But you might wonder why they're not more popular because of the fact they offer such responsive feeling. Well, the negative side to having a coil spring is the fact the amount of adjustment is very limited. An air shock, for example, they have almost an infinite adjustment on air pressure. So when you're buying a bike from a shop, the shock that's on your bike, you can set it up for your personal body weight. If you were to have a coil shock on there, chances of having the correct coil spring on there is probably 50-50, and the shop is gonna to need to stock a number of coil springs in order to suit you, the rider. It doesn't exactly work out quite so well. However, those that ride coil shocks, they're complete converts and they won't ride anything else. Okay, a few common questions that always come up now. Sag, what the heck is sag? Well, sag literally is the amount your suspension compresses when you sit on your bike wearing all the riding kit that you need to. Now it's recommended that you have between 20 and 30% sag depending on the brand of shock or fork that you have. And you need the suspension to sag down like this. So basically the fork and the shock can let the wheels extend into hollows, uh, basically and track the ground. You need it for proper control. If you look at a car when it goes over a humpback bridge, it would leave the ground if it had no sag. Yeah, the, old, the idea is the wheels drop and they track with the ground, allowing the damping to do its thing. Air volume spacers are something that comes up from time to time, and a lot of people ask, what exactly do they do? Now you can get air volume spacers for most air shocks and most air suspension forks on the market, not all, so you will need to check for your particular one. And essentially they take up space inside the air chamber of that air spring. By taking up space on the inside, you can tune the way that the, the air spring feels with None of these on the inside, it will feel slightly more linear. Of course, air in a confined space is gonna be naturally progressive, but it's gonna be slightly more linear than it would be with a few of these in. These essentially enable you to tune the feel of the, the spring as it ramps through the travel. More volume spaces, a more progressive feel. Less volume spaces, a more linear feel. It's a great thing being able to tune the spring rate characteristics of your bike. Yeah, what is compression damping exactly? Right, so think about how a suspension fork or a shock works, yeah, they're telescopic. So as they compress, they're gonna extend again afterwards. And damping, whether it's compression or rebound, needs to control those two elements, otherwise you're left with just a spring. And that's gonna mean erratic handling, okay? So compression damping, a good way to think about it is by taking a coffee filter, okay? Now imagine pushing this just through the, the actual coffee filter here with nothing in it, yeah? So that is no damping, it's no resistance, yeah? But because of this mesh, if you're to fill it up with water or coffee and push it through, you're gonna have quite a bit more resistance, yeah? So that's like adding some compression damping. Then try filling it up with custard, or imagine filling it up with custard and then pushing it through. You'll find it will have like loads of resistance. So that's the equivalent of having loads of compression damping, okay? It's all about absorbing the energy of an impact, okay? It's about stopping that impact basically coming through to you, the rider. And there's two major types of compression damping. 
you get low speed damping and high speed damping. Now don't refer to the speed that you ride a bike at, they refer to the, the speed that the shaft or the fork moves at. So a low speed damping adjustment would take care of things like your body weight. So if you're moving forwards and backwards on a bike, let's say under braking, uh, you get weight transfer, okay? But that's a low speed movement because it's weight transfer on a bike. By using low speed compression, you can help the bike stay a bit more stable to that. The same would apply for pedaling. If your bike's bobbing a little bit, you can use some low speed compression there. High speed compression is what you need for fast impacts, big impacts, jumping off things, hitting rocks and roots. That's what it takes care of. If you have too much, i.e. if you're trying to push, push the thing through custard, it's gonna feel quite harsh. And if you don't have enough, you're gonna bottom out really easily. Now you might have heard of the term shim stack. What does that mean? On the inside, of a shock absorber, you have a piston, and on that it has a series of shims. Okay, so there's going to be ports like holes, and the shims are going to be of different thickness and size. Okay, now these can be tuned, it's known as shim stack tuning, in order to control the oil flow. For example, if you're going to have bigger holes, it allows for more oil flow, so arguably less damping. Okay, um, with a smaller hole, the oil is going to struggle to get through. Yeah, so you'll apply more damping. But the same can be applied with the shims themselves. A thick shim isn't going to deflect much. Okay, so it's gonna offer more damping. Whereas a thin shim is gonna deflect quite a lot and now allowing that piston to move a bit faster through the oil. So by having a combination of thick and thin, large and small shims and different sized ports and holes, it's really quite controllable the amount of tuning that can be done to a shock to handle in different ways for different riders, different terrain and different bike designs. If you're confused about this still, then you might wanna get in touch with your local suspension tuner and they'll shed a bit more detail on it for you. Okay, so what is rebound then? Well, as you might have figured out, it controls the rate at which the fork or the shock absorber extends after an impact, okay? Now you can have lots of rebound or you can have barely any at all, depending on your preference, but also depending on your weight. Now a rider that's putting more air pressure into a shock is accordingly gonna need more rebound to control the rate at which it extends. If you have too much rebound though, your fork or your shock might not extend fast enough for the next impact. This is a phenomenon known as packing down or packing, okay? And it basically means your suspension offering, whether, whether it's front or rear, you get less and less successively between impacts and your bike will just turn into a rattly old horrible thing. So don't be tempted to put too much rebound on, have enough to control the bike. Likewise, if you have too little on there, you can actually have a bike that ends up feeling a bit like a pogo stick, and it can be dangerous at times. Just think, you've got all that energy from an impact. If it's not absorbed correctly by your compression, it's got nowhere to go except fire out again. Your rebound is the last chance to make sure that your wheel sticks to the floor. After all, suspension is about allowing the wheels to track the terrain. If you fine tune your compression and your rebound, your bike should track the floor and feel fantastic. Well, that just about covers everything to do with a basic suspension fork and a rear shock. And in part two of this video coming up next week, we're gonna be discussing the common suspension designs out there and the typical traits that they tend to have, along with a bunch of terminology that can be a bit confusing. If you've got any questions about this week's video, let us know in the comments underneath. And if you've got any questions about the suspension on your own particular bike, any setup things like that, or any problems you might be having, use the hashtag AskGMBNTech and we'll pick them up in a future episode of Ask GMBN Tech as well. All right, cool stuff. I think I'm gonna ride a bike now. See you next week.